You're watching The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. On today's programme, the most advanced data boy ever created in the UK is launched off the coast of Devon to measure the impact of climate change on our oceans. The small change is making a big difference in Manchester as the city targets a net zero future. And we meet the people in an award-winning city using urban agriculture to protect against the impacts of climate change. Hello and welcome to the UK's only daily climate news show where we track the changes happening to our world right now and meet those developing the solutions. And coming up, as momentum builds towards the COP26 climate meeting in November, I'll be speaking to former president of the summit, Claire O'Neill, about what might be achieved and whether the UK government is setting a good enough example to the rest of the world. But first, the most advanced autonomous buoy ever created in the UK has been launched off the coast of Devon. Plymouth Marine Laboratory have developed the equipment to measure ocean health, including nutrient levels and plant life, and to track how climate change is affecting the seas. Dan Whitehead was at the launch in Plymouth. More than half a million pounds of scientific kit is slowly edging towards Plymouth Harbour. Packed with sensors, its mission to measure the health of our changing oceans. We're monitoring the, the sort of standard things like temperature and salinity, but then importantly we're looking at oxygen levels, we're looking at nutrient levels in the water, we're measuring the amount of phytoplankton, so the plant life in the water, which is the base of the food chain. Um, we're also looking at the clarity of the water, pH levels, so looking at ocean acidification, all really key parameters for climate research. The boy weighs more than three tonnes and is nearly nine metres tall. All of it powered by solar and wind alone. In just a few weeks, this boy will be towed out into the English Channel where it will start collecting vital data. It's taken two years of scientific work in the lab to get to this stage. This is the sensor package that will be deployed on the winch. Um, it has a mixture of fluorometers, oxygen sensors, temperature sensors. The buoy is part of a fleet of net zero ocean monitoring equipment that's been created by the Plymouth Marine Laboratory. It's one of a kind. There's, there's nowhere else in the world at the moment that does, that does what we're going to be doing. It's a test and a trial, but it will also, um, you know, it will also give us results that, that are published um, on our website and that, are, that go on to help make policy um, in the UK and internationally. After the final tweaks to sensors and monitors, the boy will begin feeding back data from the Western Channel Observatory, five miles off the coast, next month. Dan Whitehead, Sky News, in Plymouth. Let's take a look at the day's other climate news now. And soldiers in Brazil will be sent to the Amazon in a bid to limit rising deforestation levels. President Bolsonaro has signed a decree to dispatch troops to several states, including Para and Amazonas, for two months until the end of August. Deforestation in the Amazon has been increasing for several years since Jair Bolsonaro was elected in 2018. 267 million people worldwide are living on land that's at risk of being permanently flooded by the end of the century. A new study in Nature Communications suggests the majority of land, which is less than two metres above sea level, is in tropical regions, including large parts of South Asia. One of the countries most at risk is Bangladesh, where 18.1 million people live on land that falls below the two metre level. Campaigners are accusing the government of failing to consider the environmental impact of its £27 billion road strategy. The High Court is hearing from the Transport Action Network, who claim the Department for Transport ignored climate laws for dozens of new projects, including the Lower Thames crossing in Kent. Transport Secretary Grant Shapps says the strategy will create a safe and efficient road network. And a glass sculpture containing Antarctic air from 250 years ago will go on display at the COP26 conference in Glasgow. The sculpture will have air extracted from an ice core which contains tiny bubbles from 1765. Scientists say that was the year CO2 levels started to increase in the atmosphere after being fairly consistent for around 10,000 years.
In just over four months, the UK will host the most important global climate conference in six years. COP26 will take place in Glasgow in November, bringing together world leaders, business chief executives, campaign groups and experts to agree coordinated action to tackle climate change. But with COVID still a priority for countries around the world and increasing controversy about the UK government's green credentials, there are doubts that any significant progress will be made. Well, with me now is Claire O'Neill from the World Business Council for Sustainable Development and former president for the COP26 summit. So welcome to you. And as you Thank used you. to be uh, president of COP26, I'm really interested to get your perspective over whether COP can be a success and if it can, what does that success look like? Well, I think it has to be. So, you know, that the whole plan for COP26, well before COVID was thought of, was that this was the COP where we had to stop talking and start acting, when the Paris Agreement was supposed to come to life. And one of the reasons I was able to persuade the UK government, of which I should say Boris Johnson was a very keen supporter of the idea to host the COP, was that this was a great way for the UK to show its, its very green credentials. Uh, it will be a success uh, when it happens. We know, we know we've got to do this, no more delay. It'll be a success when we can get as many countries as possible to commit to the sorts of net zero targets that the UK led the world in doing. And it'll be a success if we can get the really big developing emitters, particularly China, India, Russia, uh, and of course the US, who isn't a developing country but is the largest emitter, to be there with very specific uh, both targets and also action plans. Yes, and yet the UK has been criticised by its own climate change advisers for being big on promises, big on those targets, but short on action. So do you think the UK really is leading by example? I do. Look, one of the great things is we can have this conversation because we have a committee on climate change, which which very few countries do. It was set up as a, a sort of independent view uh, of experts. They've been amazing. They give us advice and we accept it. And I know the government will be listening. And it's true that we've set out these incredibly ambitious targets and we don't have the policies to back them up. But I'm confident that we will um, if and one big if if we increase the amount of spending in our whole COVID recovery package to focus on green items, whether it's green infrastructure, green transport, uh, retrofitting or building new low carbon homes. So we've got to back up the policy with the finance, but we have a pretty strong momentum now in the government to make sure that we do deliver on these targets. And you're involved in the push to phase out emissions from coal, aren't you? And, and I want to just show viewers our real time power mix. And you can see here that 48 49% of our energy at the moment is coming from fossil fuels. So just how good a job are we doing? How successful is the UK in reducing its reliance on coal and other fossil fuels? Well, that's, by the way, a great real-time app for nerds like us. You can actually check the real-time energy mix of the UK. And the good news is uh, we're, that fossil fuel is almost all gas. It's almost no coal. Coal has gone from being 40% of the energy mix in 2010 when I went into politics to almost none in 2020 when I came out. And we did that through a combination of carbon pricing, of, of emission standards, and a really big investment in gas and renewables. And the point about fossil fuels Fuels is coal has got to go. We've got to make coal history. It's the most polluting fossil fuel. It has terrible disbenefits in terms of air quality, in terms of health issues. And I set up a thing called the Powering Pass Coal Alliance back in 2017, along with my ministerial friend in Canada. And it's become the great um, sort of action platform for countries, city, states and companies to commit to phase out coal power by 2030. Claire O'Neill, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. The city of Manchester has committed to cut emissions by 50% by 2025 and become net zero by 2038. It's an ambitious aim that will require individuals, companies and local government to all make changes. Today, an initiative called the Nature Takeover has been launched to encourage people to live more sustainably and help the city reach its target. Lisa Lingard is the community lead at Manchester Climate Change Agency and told us more about what's being done. So we're here today in Mossai Park. We've got an amazing installation that's really engaging people to come down and find out about our new 
climate change action programme called In Our Nature. And it's about bringing the community together to develop climate action plans that will really get to the heart of what people need to do in their daily lives. But we're not just asking people and individuals to get involved. We want everybody to understand the actions that they need to take, but also what actions others need to take. So we're talking about big ticket actions, actions that are really going to make a difference to that 50% reduction. And that is decarbonizing our energy supplies, making sure that our energy systems work on renewable energy, getting people into active travel, walking and cycling around the city and becoming uh, and eating more carbon friendly foods. Now, the latest in our series of Climate Diaries focuses not on an individual doing amazing things, but on a city. The World Resources Institute Ross Centre Prize for Cities showcases innovative and sustainable ways to make cities more resilient to our changing planet. And this year's winner, announced today, is a project from the city of Rosario in Argentina on the west bank of the Paranara River. Here's why. Cuando yo empecé, éramos en el país 10 locos que estábamos con este tema, éramos muy poquitos. Tenemos ferias, entonces tenemos pedidos de bolsones y entonces llevamos nuestros bolsones. Pero por sobre todas las cosas, nosotros consumimos. áreas que pueden moderar el tema del clima por ser áreas que son áreas verdes, áreas que absorben calor y también por la captación que hacen. La idea es que esto se multiplique en todos los lugares libres que hay en Rosario porque la agroecología beneficia a todo el mundo. O sea, no tiene enemigos. Eh, transforma todo. El tema del cambio climático, el tema de incluir de lo social. Me parece que las generaciones futuras van a tener una, una mejor calidad de vida. Hasta van a poder vivir más, llevarse mejor, disfrutar de lo que hacen y bueno, eso contribuye a la felicidad de la familia. That's everything from us for today. Tomorrow we've got a special edition of the Daily Climate Show. Bangladesh Climate Frontline will report on the impact of climate change in the country from migration to money and look at the solutions being developed. That's at the same time tomorrow here on Sky News. See you then.